Finding the Door Falling away from our authentic self is thus experienced as a general phenomenon in life to which every facet of human culture is vulnerable. Its convenience, generality, and particularly its effects in the philosophical traditions are structural. For if this falling is a consequence of our absorption in the other, it must be just as much a part of our ontological structure as the fact that we generally fail to find ourselves. Thus, the tendency towards falling is an existential characteristic of default human beingness. The ontological structure of being in the world does not make authenticity impossible, but it does reveal a bias toward the ontic states in which we typically find ourselves. We always find ourselves thrown into a world whose roles and categories are structured in inherently impersonal ways, in which idle talk, curiosity, and ambiguity predominate. It follows that inauthenticity due to absorption in the other is our default position. We can then find ourselves only by recovering from our original state of lostness. In practice, attaining authentic being always involves overcoming inauthenticity. The world into which we find ourselves thrown inherently tempts us to fall away from ourselves. The most pernicious part of our fallen state is the assumption, due to the inherent ambiguity of idle talk, that our fallenness is fully authentic and genuine. Being absorbed in the world of the other thus blinds us to our real condition. This blindness finds expression in frenzied activity, a constant curiosity-driven search for the novel and the exotic. Consequently, we remain alienated from the immediate environment and from ourselves, a self-alienation that sometimes takes the form of compulsive self-analysis, skepticism, and doubt. The errors of self-understanding in various philosophical traditions are simply localized symptoms of this more general ontological state. Thus, our everyday state of being is finding ourselves thrown into inauthenticity. As long as we remain more concerned with the other than with finding our authentic selves, we remain thrust into the world and overwhelmed by the turbulence of the other's inauthenticity. We can achieve authenticity, but when we do, it is only a modified way of holding our everyday condition of falling. Ontologically speaking, authenticity is a modification of inauthenticity. One way of characterizing this average everydayness, our inauthentic being, would be as self-dispersal. We are scattered amid the constantly changing objects of our curiosity, caught up in the collection of impersonal selves that make up the other, and fragmented by our skeptical philosophical self-dissections. Then where is the doorway to overcoming fragmentation, alienation, and inauthenticity? How can we attain a unified realization of our authentic being? So far, we have only analyzed the causes and symptoms of our inauthenticity. This narrow focus is needed in the beginning. Just as an authentic mode of existence requires overcoming our self-dispersal, so a genuinely integrated understanding of our being requires gaining a powerful perspective on our fragmentation that demonstrates our underlying unity. Anxiety and Care Fortunately, there is a particular state of mind that enables us to solve these problems. Objectless anxiety, or dread. As a mode of existence, Anxiety forces us to confront the true ontological structure of our existence, and as an object of phenomenological analysis, it gives us access to a single unifying articulation of our being. Anxiety is often confused with fear. Both are responses to the world as unnerving, hostile, or threatening. 
But whereas fear is a response to something specific, anxiety is objectless. The anxious person is not anxious in the face of any particular entity in the world. Indeed, the distinctive oppressiveness of anxiety lies precisely in not being elicited by anything specific, so that we cannot respond to it in any specific way, for example, by running away. Anxiety seems to be a problem without a solution. What oppresses us is not any specific group of beings or objects, but rather we are oppressed by the entire world, or more precisely, by being in the world. Anxiety confronts us with the realization that we are thrown into the world, that we are always already delivered into situations of choice and action that we did not choose or determine, but that we have to care about and act upon. Anxiety confronts us with the determining and yet sheerly contingent nature of our own worldly existence. We are stuck with the way we wound up being, but we could just as easily be any other way. But being in the world is not only what we are anxious about, it is also that for which we are anxious. In anxiety, we are anxious about ourselves, not about some concrete possibility, but about the fact that our existence necessarily involves projecting ourselves upon one possibility to the exclusion of all others. Existential anxiety plunges us into anxiety about ourselves in the face of ourselves. In this state of focused self-consciousness, particular objects, persons, and the specific structures of the world fade away as the world as a whole occupies the foreground. Thus, when taken authentically, anxiety can begin to rescue us from our fallen state, our lostness in the other. It throws us doubly back upon ourselves, as a being for whom our own being is an issue, and also as a person capable of choice, uniqueness, and individuality. Anxiety opens the possibility of our showing up for ourselves in a distinctive way, for anxiety individualizes. This individuation brings us back from our lostness and falling, and makes manifest to us that authenticity and inauthenticity are both possibilities of our being. Our basic possibilities show themselves in anxiety as they are in themselves, undisguised by the entities of the world to which we usually cling. By confronting us with ourselves, anxiety encourages us to recognize our own existence as essentially thrown projection, and our everyday mode of existence as fallen, completely absorbed in the other. It emphasizes that we are always in the midst of the objects and events of daily life, and typically we bury ourselves in them. We do this to keep from acknowledging that our existence is always more or other than our present actualizations, so that we are never fully at home in the world. The Way Home the experience of anxiety about the strangeness of being in the world exposes the basis of our default being as thrown projection, fallen into the world. Our thrownness, openness to states of mind other than our authentic self, shows us to be already in the world. Our projectiveness, capacity for understanding the other and planning for the future, shows us to be at the same time ahead of ourselves, aiming to realize some existential possibility, and our fallenness shows us to be preoccupied with the world. This overarching triple ontological characterization reveals the essential unity of our being in the world to be what we can call care. The existential totality of our ontological structural whole can therefore be grasped in the following formal ontological structure. Our being is always already in the world, thrownness, ahead of itself, projectiveness, as being with entities encountered within the world, fallenness. 
The triple elements of our everyday being are ultimately parts of a whole. By labeling that whole care, we evoke the fact that we are always occupied with the entities we encounter in the world, concerned about ready-to-hand and present-at-hand entities, and solicitous of other human beings. The point is that, being in the world, we must deal with the world. The world and everything in it cannot fail to matter to us. While being absorbed in the world is a fundamentally inauthentic state of being, acknowledging our inauthenticity is the first step on our path back to fully integrated, authentic being. This stand is a platform from which we can begin the phenomenological process of ontic self-inquiry necessary to recover our authentic beingness.